So in your walk with God, as God speaks to you, you should be having dialogue with God. And can I can encourage you to talk to him? I used to pray every single day for my future wife. Every single day. God, I don't know where she is right now, but I just cover her. I ask you to protect her. I ask you to bless her. I ask you to cause good things to come to her life. And I would just do that kind of thing. I'd talk to the Lord about her. And I'd ask him to take care of her and protect her and just different things over her life. And do that. You can't get anything but good from praying over your future. Is that true? And so I would also ask God to tell me things about my wife. Ask God to show you things about your wife and ask God to show you things, different things to look for. Because if God starts speaking different things over you for your future, and then you find someone that you think is your future and they don't line up with what that looks like, you may be looking at the wrong thing. Because when you're with God and there's just nothing, there's no emotions, it's just you sitting with God and he starts to whisper. They're going to be, you know, let's, let's say, for instance, just as an example, they're going to be musical. They're going to love to worship me. And then you find them, it's like, they don't play any music, their voice is terrible. But we could still make this work, Jesus. We could go to vocal training. <laughs> I'm telling you, man, the mind is messed up sometimes. We will try and trick ourselves. But, but the thing is, is that if we can go back to what God has told us, it starts giving us a little breadcrumb trail of what to look for. Especially in a world where it looks like we've got options. Did you want to add anything to that? Yes. Good. <laughs> You're like, now I can have a break. Yes. Right. So... Are you guys so impressed I stayed quiet that whole time? <laughs> the self-control just took over. So, what has God said to me about my future spouse? First of all, like he's saying, and I'll say it again, you should be asking and ask again and ask again and then ask him 20 more times and then keep asking him. Amen? Because when the going gets tough and you're attracted to someone you know you shouldn't be with, what God said will guard you. It will protect you. It will stop you from engaging. And, you know, a wise person will figure out what the future is, um, the, what the future is ahead of them, you know, what God is saying. And, you know, God is not the author of confusion. He's not there to be like, oh, they're going to have blonde hair. Just kidding. They're going to have black hair. Just kidding. They're going to be from Alabama. Just kidding. And you're like, ah! Or if you don't know what God's saying about your spouse, then it's like, oh, these 50 women are all my wife. You're like, anyone could be one. You know what I'm saying? Because you're just doing your own thing. you got your own compass going. you got your own little set of rules and wants, and your emotion is dictating every five seconds what God's saying. You know, and some of you, we said this in the other session, but... Before all of this, you should be uh, cultivating that intimacy with God where you can hear his voice. And the most important decision in your whole life is being in love with God. Then the second most important decision is who you will marry. Because that's the first covenant and that's the second. And both are going to last as, as long as you're alive. Okay, and, and, and a lot of us, we can be funny and we can be emotional and we can just go along that roller coaster and just have the most fun time. And then all of a sudden, what's going on with my life? I don't even know who I'm supposed to marry. You know, and, and that's not actually how God designed it. He wants you to know. He wants to give you little, um, like he said, breadcrumb trails. He wants to like show you how good your spouse is going to be and that he's a giver of good gifts and that you are so worthy and awesome and wonderful and he's got someone worthy, awesome and wonderful waiting for you. You know, it's so, so, so important to hear what God says about who you're going to marry because if you allow your will or your emotions to dictate what you think God is saying, you'll get it wrong every time. You know, and you can't, like I said, you can't ask God enough. Ask him again. Ask him 20 times. His fear is knocking on the door. Ask him again. You know, and if you're not sure, keep asking. Ask him for scripture references. Ask God to speak to your leaders about your spouse. You know, I did that when we were dating the second time. Uh, <laughs> we totally do have to share our story, though. I said that in the first session. But anyway, when we were dating the second time, before that, I was so heartbroken from the first time that I was like, right, God, whoever I marry, I want you to not only tell me, but tell my leaders above me because I don't trust myself anymore. 
because I thought that this person was my husband, even though I was right. Uh, <laughs> I didn't know that for six years, though, so that thing was dead. You know what I'm saying? I, it was one of my requirements because, you know, when I trusted myself, the timing was six years off. Okay, when I trusted myself and my emotion and what I thought, it was wrong. And, you know, and, and honestly, until you hear from the Spirit what God is saying, don't trust anything. Don't trust someone else's opinion. Don't trust, you know, you know some of us have really invasive relatives that know. I ain't saying nothing. Okay, that think they know you and the, the, they think they know everything about your life. And how dare you marry someone with blonde hair? You know what I mean? It's like, you will never marry someone like that. You know, it's like they think that they are God's all-knowing over your life. And you might go to Asia and marry someone from Indonesia, and that might be the will of God. And someone else might be saying, no, no, no. Do you know what I'm saying? So it's really good to understand what God is saying to you, but let's take it a step further and ask God to confirm to, to your leaders or, you know what, people who you know know God. Okay, that you trust, that they have, um, they have good discernment, okay? You don't want your best friend to just tell you yes, yes, yes to everything that you want. You hear what I'm saying? Because they will. They just want to appease you. They just want you to be happy. Well, some of the best friends won't, you know what I'm saying, okay? But, uh, yeah. but still, okay? You know what I'm saying, okay? And, and like I said, knowing what God says about who you're going to marry not only will it protect you and guard you, but it'll bring you so much delight and faith and hope because the enemy is constantly trying to say things to lie to you or discourage you. You'll never be married. You're not good enough. This, this, and this. Your age is this. Or it failed before. Yeah, Do you know what I'm saying? You know, like when, when Jesus was in the desert and he was being tempted, the enemy was right there being like, well, did you know, why don't you just do this? Why don't you just do that? And he responded with, no, it is written. This is the word of God. And when you hear God in regards to who you're going to marry, when the enemy comes or he's trying to bring someone who, who is not who God wants you to bring, and it's so forceful, so in your face, you will say, it is written, devil. You know, and even against your own self, like, it is written, God told me this and this and this, and it was confirmed, and, it was, and this is what the word says. Amen, because can I add this? God will not tell you to marry someone that does not line up with what a man or a woman of God will be in the word. Do you hear what I'm saying? Oh, well, God told me that he will be from the house of Satan, you know, okay? <laughs> Whoa, but do you know what I'm saying? Okay, because sometimes we can do that. Well, God told me. So, okay, well, where does that line up with the word? Let's just go back to the word. And again, too, you know, sometimes when people say God told me, you can say nothing to them. You know, it's like, oh, well, God told me the sky's green, and that's what God said. And you're like, okay, well, how do I tell you that God didn't say that? You know, and you have to be really careful. So, again, it's like in regards to this, okay? In regards to figuring out what God is saying about who you're going to marry, have an open heart, okay? You might have a list of stuff, and we'll talk about that, but just always be open to hearing what he's saying to you, okay? Because you might marry someone who has blue eyes instead of brown. Do you hear what I'm saying? Or you might marry someone that is a worship leader. You never thought you'd marry a worship leader. Do you know what I'm saying? So just have an open heart and let the Lord tell you and let him tell you again and again and again. And when fear is knocking, let him tell you again. And you know what? If you're struggling and you can't hear God and you thought you heard God on something, it's just like, like I said, get someone alongside you. Get a leader in your life. We're here available for you. So if you need someone to speak into your life, we're here. It doesn't matter how well you know us. Our lives are for uh, people. We give our lives away. You don't have to sign a membership form to come to our church, okay? You know what I'm saying? Or get help from us because we're here for you, all right? So, you know, if you're confused or you need help, you know what? Just get along some people who know God, and they'll encourage you and tell you, like he said, you will be married in Jesus' name, and it will be someone who is uh, totally the desire of your heart, and it'll be a special, precious gift from heaven because, like I said, it is the most important decision you will make in your life after salvation. There you go. <laughs> so I'm just going to double back on a couple of things she said, and then we're going to move to the next, the next thing. But um, using the term, and I'm really going back to the beginning of what I started, that we can really pretend to really know what we're doing. 
and we tell ourselves we know what we're doing and it's an insecurity thing. The best stance that you can have is a stance of humility. Pride will be totally blinded to things that could be train wrecks heading your way that other people desperately want to tell you that are mature and seasoned in God that have maybe been given insight. Like, for instance, you know, as leaders, as pastors, we have, you know, a certain level of, like, it's called oversight for a reason because God actually gives you a certain level of insight into people's lives in your group that you're leading that maybe isn't apparent to anybody else. And sometimes you can see things in the spirit supernaturally over people's lives that no one else could ever see. And if that person's trying to tell you something, but you are pretending like you're in control and you know exactly what you're doing, you're never going to receive the message. Does that make sense? So having a, having a position of warning, like for instance, like, you know, sometimes we don't even understand at times how we kind of wander off. You know, start, you know, in a certain angle on something. Like Paul said this, he goes, what happened to you? What, what, what bewitched you? What spell got on you? Because you started in the spirit. You started so well, but you ended up way off in the flesh. Like, you just slowly change the temperature, you know? And so having a, you know, just an approach of just being like teachable and humble and just coming down and just being open because honestly, you would rather get something right than running into something that maybe wasn't God, getting married and having a giant disaster. I've had friends that did that and their life hasn't been easy. You know, God will still help you, but it's the, it's not the road that's blessed. It's road that God will come to and he will put blessing on, but it's not necessarily the ideal blessing of God. We talked about that last time, I think, about the about the perfect, the accept the, the, the perfect, the permissible, and the acceptable will of God, the different levels of God's blessing on something. You want to be walking in the perfect will of God. Romans chapter twelve. You want to have that in your life where you have access to actually get a hold of something where this is what God dreamed over me and I'm starting to realize it. This, is, this person was made by God before the beginning of the world. He thought of Rebecca Billings, Rebecca Stubbs at that time, before I ever met her. And when he made her, part of her design was to be my wife. Isn't that amazing? And to have that confidence that God has made someone for you is amazing. And you don't want to run ahead of that. Okay? So being humble and just open and willing and be real careful on the God said stuff. I've done it. I've been a fool with it. But it is very, very, very dangerous. My personal rule, just so everyone knows, is the second God says, someone says God said to me, I don't say anything. Because if I challenge you, I'm challenging your God. Does that make sense? And I'll try and wait until I can help. But once you've said God said, it's a very difficult thing to get over. Because I'm challenging your faith. Instead of like, here's a really awesome way to ask a question. This is what I'm thinking. What do you think? What's your thoughts on this particular thing? Whether it be like dating or anything in life. But the second, like, I mean, I've had people come to me and say, hey, I'm going to do this business God said. And I just look at them and said, are you? I'll see you in six months. You know, I'll help pick up the pieces. And, it, like, that's not condescending. That's just, like, I've just been disabled from being able to help. So when you go into stuff, just, like, just be humble and soft and just try and be soft-hearted because I know we can get excited and I know that we love to be super spiritual and we like to spiritualize stuff but there's just an element where that can be so dangerous does that make sense I'm just spending a bit extra time on top of what Beck said because it's a big one okay the second you say like here this is a verse in Proverbs that God really highlighted to me in the dating years of my life and I don't have the reference on me but I can find it for you do not commit something as holy unto the Lord and then later recon, uh, reconsider your vows. Okay? This person is my wife, God said. And you tell like 500 people on Facebook. Relationship status changed six months later. Oops. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> it happens. Okay? Just... 
Take it slow. Don't commit stuff as like this is God said and you'll be safe. Walk it out. Let God prove himself. If it's God, everyone's going to know. You don't need to tell everybody that statement. Does that make sense? And just always look for uh, confirmations. Yeah, go ahead. And I'll just say really quick, just don't be a weird Christian in that area. Can I just say that? <laughs> don't be weird. Like, yes. God said it was this person five years ago, and they're just dating someone else. Actually, they're engaged now, but they don't know it yet, and I'm just waiting in the wings. Okay. We've had people that, like, I talked to where she believed he was hubby. Hubby got married. She still believed. Yes. And that's that, weird. Yeah. And that's where Anyways. you get into praying, like, <laughs> praying illegally in the spirit over people, you know? You ain't got to be praying over that person while they've already co covenanted to someone else. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And until the ring is on it, don't be so full on with that. You know what I'm saying? It's like we can be weird in our Christianity and people in the world are like, whoa, you are like way off on cloud 20. What are you even saying? And some stuff they won't understand. Okay. But, you know, let's just be careful that we're not being Christian and weird with God said and you're stalking people on the Facebook and you're stalking people on other things and you're like... <laughs> you know, following them to conferences and stuff, and like, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I repent! Just kidding. Okay, but you know what I'm saying? Like, it's okay if the Lord's leading you, ah, but still. And um, can I just put this tidbit in? Yep. Were you going to say a tidbit too? Yes. This is my little tidbit. Let's see how little it is. And don't be offended, okay? <laughs> Biblically... It is the man's job to pursue the woman. Preach. Can I get a witness? Preach. <laughs> okay, you don't got to be no desperate virgin. You know what I'm saying? Or you might be not a virgin, but don't be desperate, okay? And don't be all hailing on guys. It actually puts them off. They are hunter-gatherers. They want to pursue you. You just go ahead and be beautiful and be confident. That's another topic. But still, okay? <laughs> Go friend, it's not up to you to stalk for 20 hours a day and see exactly what he's doing, when he's doing it, and on Snapchat, and when he's breathing, and when he's going to the bathroom. It's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Take it back to reality. You know what I'm saying? Okay? And that's not a disdaining thing against women. That's how God created humanity, for the woman to be pursued by the man. And these days, there's a huge um, feminist rising and uh, women are erupting into this, don't you dare hold me down, and yes, I can pursue my man. It's like no one's saying you can't, but let's just function the way we were created to be functioning. Okay? It's, it's biblically, you look all through the stories of relationships, the men were pursuing the women. And that's not old school, old covenant back in the day. No, no, no. That's how God created humanity. And God understands each gender a lot better than we do. Mm -hmm. Because in our generation, genders are mixing, and men are like women, and women are like men, and no one is really standing up in their gender in the way God created them to be. And it's not a disdaining thing. It's not saying that women can't stand up and be strong. I'm I'm as strong as they get. Some of you who know me, you know that. Okay? That's not what I'm talking about. Can I get a witness? That's not what I'm talking about. <laughs> it's okay to be strong. It's okay to be, a, 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 you know, passionate about women and all that good stuff. Okay? But there, there is a fine line where you need to uh, step back and be pursued. Okay? It's not your job to spend hours and hours and hours stalking. And you know what? Because women are emotional, they get into a place that's actually not reality. We watch so much TV. We watch, we're on social media constantly, which most of the time is not reality. Can I just tell you that? Mm -hmm. Okay, you can be whoever you want to be on social media, but that's not telling me who you really are. Because people will run their mouths off and say this and get the right pose and the right angle. <laughs> and you see them in real life, and they won't say that offensive thing to your face. Or they won't show you that, well, you, do you hear what I'm saying? 
You know, we got to live in reality. We got to pull our heads in. And we, you know, the world, as the world goes on, it's getting further and further away from how God originally yep. des- designed humanity. Okay, and we cannot take our blueprint from social media or from the way that the trends of the world that are so in our face, because it's right here at our access. Okay, we need to read the Bible and, and listen to good sound teaching and let that guide us uh, where we're supposed to go in our lives. Amen. Very good. Amen. And we're going to touch on this a little bit in the next session three. But, you know, what Bex is starting to touch on here is actually around denying the other's role of actually walking out the way God made them to be. Woman, if you don't let a man pursue you were beginning to neuter the way God made him and he will become half of a man. And we're going to talk about that in the next in the next session about how a woman has been made by God and what she needs and how a man's been made by God and what he needs and how we can't deny or how we can't train the other to actually not fulfill the way God made them to function. Because otherwise you're denying God's created design. And you will ultimately damage yourself because it'll eventually come around and it'll eventually be a big problem for you. Mm. Temporary gain, long-term pain. So we're going to talk about that in session three, little spoiler alert, but that was, I thought I'd add that in there. Um, So really touching on this next point here that Bex kind of started really walking into is has God released you to date now? Has, you, have, has God actually said, hey, I'm bringing you into a season, now's the time? Hey, see that person over there? Like, honestly, the best feeling in the world being single. God taps you on the shoulder. See that person over there? I want you to get to know them. There might be someone there. You know? <laughs> Just backing up a little bit to what Bex was talking about, or like, you know, getting overly spiritually weird. Do understand that even though God can say, that's your wife, if God... Do you have to understand that God will actually not bend another person's will? And if they choose to go in another direction, it's not your responsibility to convince them otherwise. People can choose against God's will. Hello. We all do it almost every day. So if God says something, that's your spouse, and it doesn't work out, don't give up on God. Understand that they just abdicated from the role in your life and God is getting the next person ready. Does that make sense? Because sometimes that can be a very confusing concept where you know that God's spoken to you and that's how weird stuff can happen because you're so convinced that God's spoken to you and yet they're going in another direction. Maybe they didn't hear from God. Maybe they don't want to walk the way God wanted them to walk. God's still going to help them, but don't you follow them down that path. You stay exactly where you are and you let God just bring the next person back into the role. Does that make sense? I'm not cheapening it. I'm just telling you not to cheapen yourself. Make sense? Okay, so really it's, it's finding, like the Bible says that a man or a woman of God discerns both timing and judgment. So God's going to tell you a certain thing. Like for instance, God might point out and say, hey, see that girl over there, that's your wife. Or hey, see that guy over there, that's your husband. That doesn't mean he told you to go off and tell them. That doesn't mean that, guys, he told you to go and ask her out on a date. He might just be telling you, hey, that person over there, I want you to pay attention. Make sense? The Bible says, I talked about in the last session, it says five times in Song of Solomon, do not awaken love until it's ready, or do not awaken love until it pleases. You might know the intention of God, but if you jump the gun, you can create a mess. Because if they're not ready, they might turn around and not want to have anything to do with you ever, and you might just have to wait out that season. Okay? Is this okay, guys? Because knowing what God's saying can be easy, but sometimes it takes digging a little deeper to hearing the timing of what he's saying. So don't, like God can be sitting having a conversation with you. I think I've said this before, but God can be sitting having a conversation with you and he starts his first sentence and he says, hey, see that person over there, that's your spouse. And before he can tell you the timing, you've already run out the door to go and ask the man on a date and he's trying to, he's finishing what he's saying, but you didn't hear it. And we can be so hasty and I, actually that's the last thing I wanted to talk, well, the second last thing I wanted to talk about back here, that, you know, we have to not be so hasty Society's taught us to be hasty. Society has taught us that anything we want, like for instance, this morning, 
I got up, I got on my, my phone, I went to my cart on Amazon, and I purchased like six things which are getting shipped to my house. I didn't have to get in my car. I just got on my phone. I looked at what I wanted. I pressed click, and then I pressed buy. That's how easy it is to get stuff now. And we don't really understand how much that has programmed us on how we live our lives. Because you see, you know, 100 years ago, if you wanted butter, or 200 years ago, you'd go out, you'd milk the cow, you'd get the milk, then you'd separate the curds, then you'd start beating the, the cream, and then you'd, you know, all of a sudden now the cream, now you add salt, and now you've got butter. Like, it wasn't just, hey, I went down to Albertsons and picked up a couple of blocks of butter, and while I was there, I got some popcorn and ice cream too. You see how we've been changed? See, good things take time. Good, like wine, it takes time to mature. Cheese takes time to mature. Good things take time. Don't think that anything good from God is just going to, oh, it just, he appeared right in front of me. Adam took time preparing himself in the garden, doing what God had shown him to do. It didn't, just because it's like one verse after the next, didn't mean that that wasn't 20 years. Think about that for a second. God took time letting Adam prepare himself and get situated in the garden. And then he was like, hey, here's your wife, by the way, because I noticed you needed one. Because I noticed it wasn't good you hanging out by yourself. You see, if you can't actually just be comfortable and relaxed and healthy in your life as you are right now, you're not going to be healthy with a second person. You're going to have double the trouble. So don't be hasty rushing into something before you're ready, even if you know what God's saying because you could sabotage the very blessing that you're waiting so desperately for. Is that okay? Okay, Bex, the next bit's on you. Okay. I just want to talk about, you know, and we're asking ourselves, are we ready to date, et cetera, et cetera. And one of the big questions you have to ask yourself is, have I been healed from past wounds? Because if you haven't, you're going to bring that wound into the next relationship. Okay, and, and sometimes, you know... Sometimes we can think it's kind of like uh, it's kind of like this, okay? So someone gets hit by a bus. This is nice. Okay, they get hit by a bus, and they go into a coma. Okay, all signs of life are not there. They look like they're dead. The machines are keeping them alive. They're not responsive. It looks totally dead. But let me tell you, that thing's still alive. And until they're officially dead, dead, They're just in a coma. And sometimes in our lives, when we get wounded, it feels like a bus hitting us. And sometimes we think, oh, well, that just, you know, like he said, time went on and things happened. And, you know, if you haven't truly brought those wounds to Jesus, the great physician, to heal you, they are not going anywhere. Time will not make it go away. You just give it a little moment and someone, like he says, presses a little button. Often that's a wound inside of you. We call it our button or that place we don't want anyone to go. Let me tell you, let me just give you some words for that. It's called a wound. It's called, you know, like when someone injures themselves, you don't want everyone touching the open wound. It's like, whoa, don't touch that. That hurts. You know, and in our lives, we can think, you know, uh, stuff hit us and it's, that's dead. I'm dead to that wound. I'm dead to that emotion. But then something comes along and that thing's just in a coma. It's still alive. It's still there in my heart. And, you know, and some of us think too, okay, you could be like, well, you know, the big bus hitting me was God's healing and boom, that thing was, the healing came once and it was done and all signs of that wound's life died. No, no, it was in a coma. And, you know, as much as I like to say the one time of hit, of, of healing or freedom, you know, will deliver you completely forever and God does do that. It's, it's often not that it's often a process of healing. And he'll bring it up again, and he'll bring healing. And then it'll bring it up again, and he'll heal you some more. And then it'll go through this way, and he'll heal you some more. You know, and, and, you know, Jesus, I've preached this before, but he's all about the journey. And if your heart is open, and if you're willing to let Jesus come and be the great physician, and you're willing to let him touch that hurt, he will not only heal it, but he'll take the pain away. Okay, you might have scars from past relationships. You might have hideous things that have happened to you or you feel guilty of in your life. That doesn't mean that Jesus can't heal that. Amen? Okay, his power is great enough to cover every single wound. Okay, by his stripes we are healed. That's not just physically, that's emotionally. That's on our hearts. Again, one of the worst things you can do is to get into a relationship full of wounds. 
Because it's only a matter of time before someone accidentally touches the wound and you're like, ah, don't touch that. And you snarl and growl and you bite. And you're like, get away from me. And they're like, whoa, I thought this was God. Like, what did I do wrong? I'm sorry. I just gave you chocolate ice cream and I should have never done that. Someone wounded you with chocolate ice cream before. How dare I even say the word chocolate, you know? And it sounds funny, but it's like that. It's like, whoa. And it's like something that would be normal to someone else that hit you a certain way and you're like, that doesn't feel nice. I don't like that. You know, and, and, and you know what? You were not created to carry wounds. It's dysfunctional for you to have wounds. And Jesus died on the cross, and we live this side of the cross. That means he resurrected, and he has life and freedom and healing for us right now. Amen? Amen. You don't have to live with wounds in your life. And part of the way that you can prepare to date somebody is to allow the great physician to shine his doctor's light right on in that heart of yours. And you know what? That's another thing. It's like we love to ask God what our spouses are going to be like 20 times a day, like I was saying. But how many times do we like to ask God, is there a wound there? Is there something in my heart that I might not have seen? Because often when you get wounded in an area, you want to you wanna run away from that thing and you turn your face completely away and you want to ignore it and pretend like it's not there, but it's there. And we need to allow the Lord to bring that thing to the surface, let him see it and bring healing and put that wound to rest forever. Because if not, you will treat your future spouse, you will punish them for the wounds that have happened to you in the past by someone else. And it's not fair. Okay, it's not fair to punish someone who they didn't even do that to you. And all of a sudden you're like all this rage and anger and, and, and you know, you just want to get revenge. And this poor person is only trying to love you, okay? And I want to tell you this too. Your past will not dictate your future. So whatever wounds happen in the past, that's not happening in the future in Jesus' name because the power of Jesus is there to set you free completely. And, you know, sometimes if you're wounded, you will be attracted to another person wounded in that very same area. It's this crazy law of attraction with wounds. It's like you'll be drawn to someone who's like got the same hurt in that area. And sometimes people like that because they can relate and lick their wounds together. But that's actually the most destructive thing that could possibly happen because both of your wounds will rise up and you'll destroy each other. Okay, so we need to understand that the future will not be that wounded past. But in order to embrace the future, you need to embrace that first. You need to embrace the wound. You need to allow the Lord to shine his light. Okay, don't hide from it anymore. And it might hurt. It might hurt a lot. And you might be ashamed because you think you wounded yourself and it was your fault. Okay, it doesn't matter whose fault it is. The matter is that you get healed from that thing still wounding you. Because you know a wound in the, in the, in the natural, you can, you can wound yourself once, but if that thing ain't healed, man, you can like inflict another wound upon wound upon wound. And it's just, you can have your whole leg cut off. Okay. And it's the same with the spirit. If a wound is not healed, it will, it will increase and grow bigger and bigger and bigger until it's all consuming. And you end up, you end up forming what you want in your life in a person around that wound instead of around the word. Okay, oh, I don't like people who are kind of charismatic because someone who was charismatic before wounded me. I don't like that. So in the future, I'm going to go for a real conservative Christian guy because that wounded, you know, that made me not want that anymore. It's like, okay, well, is that the Lord telling you who you're going to marry or is that that wound dictating to you who you're going to marry? Oh, some girl with blonde hair, blue eyes. (laughs) 